Let me just uh, first start with uh, some main things that we in Tel Aviv University, in the research centers, and even while teaching, basically what we have in mind is kind of a working assumption that says that what happens in the Middle East makes the tools and the insights that we use in the 20th century not that valid. Other way around, what we have to do is just to develop or elaborate on that and develop new tools and new insights by which to better analyze the region. This is not the Middle East we had or we knew in the 20th century. Three things should be reckoned with in this regard. And I'll just try to keep brief and then we'll deal with Israel, of course. The first of which, the one-man gallery show is not there anymore. So, I mean, it went without saying that while talking about the 20th century, Gaddafi was equivalent to Libya, Saddam Hussein to Iraq, Bashar al-Assad, Syria, it went without saying that when we are dealing with what they call Mukhabarat state or police states, the public has no role whatsoever there. What we know now is that the public is voicing its wishes, dreams. They can gather in the square and we can uh, be sure about one thing. Tahrir Square in uh, Cairo, Tahrir Square in Sana'a, this is something we're going to see more and more in the 21st century. So the bottom line here is that iron fist dictators are not going to have the whole game for themselves or by themselves. We have a much more complex or complicated political game with the public coming to the fore and if we would like to better understand the dynamics of politics within states we have to take it into account and this is a different ball game second while there are real hopes for a better future while the youth in the Arab states are vying for more job opportunities Facebook, Internet, etc. What happened in some states in the region is uh, sort of a breakup. In states like Syria, Lebanon, Iraq, Yemen, Libya, composed of different types and minorities, in my opinion, states that are basically artificial, most of them were created by the British and the French in the aftermath of the Great War or the First World War. In such states, the toppling of the dictator, the weakening of the dictator, resulted in kind of a breakup. And what we have in some states, if we just look at the Fertile Crescent, huge sectarian war. There is no Syria. People do talk about Syria, but there is no Syria. Syria is something that belongs to the past. What we have in Syria nowadays is a bunch of power centers. Some of them are being ruled by Al-Qaeda, by Bashar. There is Alawistan. The Kurds are declaring their autonomy in Hasake or Qamishli in northeast Syria. And this breakup could be seen also in Iraq, because in the north of Iraq, we have a de facto independent state, Iraqi Kurdistan. The flags there are Kurdish. The Iraqi army is not allowed in. So this is a, this is a state for all means and purposes. And we just heard uh, two weeks ago that in the west of Iraq, a branch of Al-Qaeda, Dawla Islamiyya, actually has settled in and created kind of a stronghold. So basically, one should take into account that when we are talking about the Middle East, we are moving forward. But in a way, what was proved in the last three years is not only that the people 
has a voice and that the people are going to play a role here. But at the same time, we have to agree that in some parts of this region, what we call primordial identities or pre-state identities are much more resilient than national identities. And I'd rather look at the Fertile Crescent not as three states, Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, but kind of an arena of confrontation where a huge sectarian war between Sunnis and Shi Shiites is being taken place, for better or for worse. And in the mid, there is a genocide in Syria. Al-Qaeda activists are capitalizing here and there on some slices of territory. And this is the observation. Of course, it's not Egypt, it's not Iran, it's not Turkey. Those are huge civilizations, not artificial states. But artificial states that were created by the, st by the West, as I said before, are experiencing, as an indirect result of the Arab Spring, kind of a breakup. And this makes the whole story much more volatile and much more uh, problematic. I would say also one thing that has to do with the superpowers, and this is kind of a pattern in the history of the region, at least when it comes to the Fertile Crescent, there is sort of a patronage politics. Bashar is being supported by Russia and the Iranians. Rebels are being supported by Qatar, Saudi Arabia, Turks, some Americans, some by the Americans. And in the end of the day, this serves to deepen up the already existing cliffs. This is also a modus operandi or a pattern that was seen in this region in the 19th century when the British supported the Druze, the French the Maronites, and so on. When it comes to the geopolitics of the region, one should also take into account that the United States is much less, I would say, penetrative, much more hesitant. It's a different United States when it comes to its modus operandi in the region. The Russians are gradually coming in, Chinese too, so basically in the 21st century, in the coming decades, I think, we're going to have a different formula when it comes to the superpowers and the region. And definitely it has to do with the calculus of each player. So what I'm trying to say is that there is a, there is a tumultuous change within states, among and between states, and even when it comes to the superpowers and the region. So I accept the notion that the whole Middle East is at a crossroads. Israel too, of course. But what this crossroads or this, let us say, stage requires, first of all, is kind of an understanding what the Middle East has become or what the Middle East is now in order to deal with the problem and not with the symptom. And basically, this is a very tricky thing, I think, and we uh, uh, are trying hard to come up with kind of a formula by which to start explaining the region. Unfortunately, I think that many are dealing with the Middle East as if we do talk about the 20th century. So if you are going to Geneva to find kind of a way for peace in Syria without understanding that there is no Syria, it means that you are dealing with the symptom and not the problem. And basically, I won't delve into too many details on that because this is not the topic, but this is what Israel sees. Let's talk about Israel. Israel in the Arab Spring is a spectator. It has nothing to do with the Palestinian-Israeli conflict or the Arab-Israeli conflict. It has to do with corruption of rulers. It has to do with an authentic cry coming from the young people of the Arab states to have 
better life, more job opportunities, more accountability. And that by itself is a revolution for me. In Arabic, they call it Haybet al Sulta. Barriers of fear collapsed. So basically, what I said before is that the psychological motive is one of the main elements of this Arab Spring. People have broken the barriers of fear. And this is the most important thing here. But when it comes to Israel, and I agree with the main uh, assumptions that were put forward actually by the chair, and I, I, I fully agree with you, Paul. I mean, in the beginning it was said that it would actually harm Israel's future or interest. But I think that uh, Israel has, on the one hand, some dangers and concerns to be dealt with, to be dealt with. And on the other, some opportunities. Israel in the 20th century grew up under the assumption that there are two strong neighbors who could pose existential threat to Israel. It was Egypt and Syria. With Egypt, of course, we have a peace treaty. But while looking at Egypt and Syria nowadays, it goes without saying that Egypt is very weak. Having a lot of problems with the brothers. Striving for kind of a stability. And Egypt could not pose an existential threat to Israel in the coming decades. By the way, Egypt and Israel are fully cooperating when it comes to the struggle against the common enemy, Salafist and Jihadist, in the Sinai Peninsula, which says something about this Middle East. If you have a shared interest with another party, if you have a common denominator, even if this would be an ad hoc alliance, This is something on which you can build up kind of a bridge. Syria and Lebanon. Huge sectarian war, I said. If Hezbollah is being attacked in a Dahya quarter in Beirut by Sunnis, well, this is the end of the world. Because there is no meaning. If we are talking about Syria or Lebanon, as I said before, this is one arena of confrontation. And Israel should be very careful not to be dragged into that kind of a mess. Because this is a bloody, never-ending war. What Israel is trying to do is to come up with... Uh, I. I, I I think actually using the scalpel, not the hammer. Only once or while Bashar is delivering, delivering kind of, a, let us say, dangerous weaponry in, in the mind of Israel to Hezbollah, Israel could hit. But basically, Israel has no interest in getting into what we call Syria and Lebanon. In the beginning, Israel was of the opinion that Bashar should be toppled. Not that Israel should topple him. But Israel rather had him toppled. I think, like many, nowadays, while listening to these guys of Al-Qaeda who have settled in, in Syria, in some parts of Lebanon, in Iraq, many would say, actually, let me, do, let me live with the devil I know. Bashar and his father had kind of a tacit agreement with Israel. We do not attack via Golan Heights. We go with Iran or cooperate with Iran. 
And if we would like to harass you, harass Israel, we're going to do that via Lebanon. That was the unwritten pact. And everybody knew the rules of the game. And this is sort of, sort of, yeah, stability. At least you know actually what the other is up to. This is something you don't know today because there is no Syria. Jihadists cannot pose existential threat to Israel, but they can harass Israel. And Israel should start to develop kind of a way by which to better deal with what we call non-state actors, because this is what we have here. What Israel is more concerned and very concerned with is the Iranian uh, nuclear program. But again, actually, Israel is, you know, Israel is very vociferous on that. Not vociferous as Saudi Arabia is. But again, there are some Arab states who would like to see Iran being checked in this interim agreement with the West or 5 plus 1. And without actually delving into too many details, you should understand that behind the scenes, Israel might have cooperation with states who are not necessarily what we call Zion lovers, but states who would like actually to check Iran, Sunni Arab states. The golden opportunity for Israel, having said that, it's kind of a chance to close a deal with the Palestinians. I, I fully agree with that. And I fully agree with the idea of two-state solution. And by the way, most Israelis would argue that the two-state solution is the best solution one could achieve in order to get closer or to end up this conflict. It is tragic, actually, to understand that everybody knows where the line should be drawn, how we're going to see it in the final destination, but it seems that nobody knows how to get to the first station. What I'm trying to say is that many Israelis are of the opinion that if we are not going to have two-state solution, one way or the other, we cannot secure Israel as a Jewish and democratic state. And I'm trying to give you here what my fellow Israelis say. If you would like to have the hinge of Israelis, this is it. To have a tiny Israel the 67 borders, a democratic Israel, but Israel that would secure Jewish majority, the only Jewish state in the world. And uh, it doesn't matter if you accept that or not, but this is what Israelis have in mind. If you can guarantee a Jewish and democratic Israel in 67 lines, we're going to buy that. But here comes another thing, and this is the obstacle. Israelis do not believe that a two-state solution would provide hermetic or 100% security for Israel. Why? And this is not something which is right or wrong or good or bad. I'm talking about twisted perceptions of both sides on each other. Twisted perceptions. This is the disease of the Middle East. What Israel is afraid of, what Israelis are anxious about, is a Palestinian state would be turned into kind of a Trojan horse with Qaeda activists getting in or whatever, firing Israel on Israel rockets, 
I'm not sure if you are familiar with the geography of Israel, but just try to think of a situation where your west is far from your east. This is kind of, I mean, the uh, sort of 20 kilometers. Just think of that. It's nothing. I don't know if you've been to Israel, but this is nothing. Israel is like kind of a, a strip. But if you are standing on the Mediterranean, going east to the eastward, let us say point, providing that Israel is in the line of 67, 15 minutes you are there driving. 15 minutes, maybe 13 minutes. Okay, so first of all, Israelis and Jews have a psyche. Some of them are bearing the Holocaust situation or syndrome and bring it in. Whether it, they can do that, they can't help it, but it is there. Second, people do talk about what happened in the withdrawal that was initiated by Israel a couple of years ago, or, or just uh, uh, almost a decade. And that was resulted in thousands of rockets on our southern cities and villages nearby Gaza. So it's a matter of, it's not, we do not talk about peace, by the way. Israelis do not believe in peace. I think Palestinians do. We are talking about agreement. So if you try to sort it out, what you should come up with is kind of an agreement that would secure Israel's future in security manner. And this is why they talked to Abdullah, king of Jordan, and asked him to provide what we call kind of monitoring machineries there in the Jordan Valley in order to appease Israel or provide Israel with some guarantees that its future is being secured in that system. We'll have to wait and see. I agree that this is a crossroads. And I would like actually to make the most of it because I think that if we are not going to have an agreement Yes, it could be, I mean, we could get closer to a third intifada, maybe. To have a unilateral state, or one state, from the Mediterranean to River Jordan, this would be a disaster for Israel. This is undoable. With the passage of time, actually, it would be counterproductive. Israelis know that. And don't underestimate Benjamin Netanyahu in that regard. Benjamin Netanyahu grew up in a kind of a right-wing camp in a family that thought that greater Israel should be achieved. Both banks of River Jordan even. Well, that was a dream. But you can't make it. You can't achieve it. Palestinians and Israelis should strive a middle course. We have a middle-of-the-road solution for the sake of both, I would say, peoples. We have a lot of Palestinian friends in Tel Aviv University. We go to Ramallah. We led a delegation and we met Abu Mazen two weeks ago. I just was there with students. When it comes to the ground, when people do talk to each other, you know that there is huge potential. But when it comes to, let us say, those existential stuff, Jerusalem, refugees, when you deal with those issues, well, people just take one step or more back, saying, well, this is not something which is negotiable. And Palestinians have problems within their societies, and Israelis too. 
I have to actually argue against some other in Israel who would argue the opposite. That you shouldn't talk that way. That this is something that goes against our interests. One of the things I would like you actually to internalize. Israel is not a monolith. Israel is not a monolith. We are just 7 million people. But we have many, many sections, many camps. And we have our lunatics too. You should know that. What I'm trying actually to... What I'm trying actually to make is kind of an argument that maybe because of the Arab Spring, and this is why you should ask yourself how come that John Kerry is visiting this region, Israel and Palestine, 15 times a year. Why? When you know what Afghanistan is, what Iraq is, what Syria has become, when you know what an acute problem is, comparatively speaking, you know that the Palestinian-Israeli conflict is solvable. You can solve it out. We need goodwill. We need some courage coming from both leaders. We need education to talk to people to respect the other. The reason why I won't talk about peace but by agreement, is because if we would like to have real peace, we have to invest in education. And this would take years on years, or by years. In Palestine and in Israel. Just to respect the others. To accept the otherness. This is not that easy. It sounds like kind of an academic theory. But if we would like actually to go through that, this is kind of a mission that should be dealt with thoroughly by both peoples. So basically, Israel is at a crossroads, I agree. But this is kind of a golden opportunity. One of the reasons people do ask time and again, ask themselves whether that kind of a, let us say, solution would facilitate a clearer atmosphere with the Arab states, or most of them. Much more economic cooperation, which I agree, and I think that it could pave the way for that. And here you go. If you have bad understandings with Arab states, not to mention the Palestinians, maybe you could have a nucleus, a solid nucleus, by which to make sure that there are a lot of voices actually protesting against a nuclear Iran or coming up with some actions by which to check or to prevent Iran from becoming nuclear. We won't deal with Iran. But again, I mean, this is a thing that we have to just uh, bear in mind. We have here also some anxieties that are being produced by the uh, scenario or by the future vision of a nuclear Iran. And this by itself has to do with the geopolitical or the geopolitics of the region. Let me stop here. Just to so I'll stop here, and if you could just... Uh... Sure. Yeah. Okay, well, um, Muzi, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, an excellent uh, overview about... Uh...